Today I want to talk about something called the Fugai. It was a medieval housing project that was created in 1524, which is still operating and still solvent after 500 years in operation. The place takes care of about 250 people who live in 67 buildings that are divided up into 147 apartments. The rent there costs one euro per year. And this place has managed to remain functional, solvent, and a quite pleasant community for over five centuries. So we're going to take a look at what this place is like and the broader subject of how did medieval communities take care of poor people? What were those communities like? And how did they manage a project like this so well? Whereas today we often have so much trouble with public housing and with so many other uh, social welfare efforts that we make in different uh, countries around uh, the, the Western world and in the U.S. in particular. So to understand the Fuguerai, uh, we have to look at where it was. And where it was was a, a city called Augsburg in the early 16th century. Uh, Augsburg was a free city, which is a special kind of a community that is really hard for people today to understand. It's quite a bit like a city-state, although that too is hard to understand. It's not quite a city-state. There were city-states at the same time at, that the Fugari uh, existed uh, down in Italy and in Russia and other places. A uh, free city is a little bit different in the sense that it's nominally part of a state or a proto-state, in this case, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so they, they owe nominal fealty to the emperor. They don't really pay taxes to the emperor, but they have to provide troops in the times of war. And that works both ways, because in theory, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the uh, other entities, including many other free cities and some of the princes, uh, the, the very powerful nobility that are closer to them in the same region that they're in, which was at, at that time called Swabia, uh, will all join together if there's a common threat. So if France invades or the Turks invade or something like that, then um, they, have, they have allies. And the, the, the difference between a free city and a, and a city-state in practice means is that the free cities tend to be a little bit more moderate than true city-states. Uh, they're not as quite as ruthless. And they don't, especially in Central Europe, they did not really fight with each other that much. They tended to fight fairly often, but against the princes, against the really powerful nobles, and also against the sort of lower and mid-ranking nobles who are often engaged in, in robbery. They, these people that they called robber knights or raubritte. Uh, they did have their own foreign policy. So a, a city like Augsburg uh, would have emissaries in, in, the, in the courts of foreign countries, you know, in, in kingdoms around Europe and uh, other regions around Europe and in many other towns. These places were fortified, so that's a really important part of this story. Uh, they they spent the vast majority of their public expenses on self defense. Uh, in fact, what these these uh, communities were called and are called today by academics are communes, uh, but that that's a term that uh, is rather fraught in our era. And in this case, it doesn't mean communism or socialism. There there's some elements of of socialism, you might say, in, in, from a certain perspective, but um, it's really not about that. It's about armed self-defense. It's about a community of people who really have a lot of different agendas and, and are various different levels of wealth and, and uh, skill and have different levels of resources and so on, but they're all united in the concept of we must defend where we live. We all live in this place and we defend it against any kind of trouble from outside. And what that translates to is basically three things. Uh, first and foremost, fortifications. These places are just really, really well fortified, especially in this part of, of uh, Europe at that time, in, in uh, Central Europe and Holy Roman Empire in the early 16th century. These places are very, very well protected by heavy stone and brick walls, towers. And then the second element is that they have weapons and they would have like 
weapons that are high tech for the time. So these towns were areas of cultural genesis. They were very sophisticated technologically. They were really were they were the engine of the all the new technology that was appearing in the Renaissance was coming yeah. out of free cities and city states pretty much. The vast, vast majority. And that included things like better and better cannon and firearms which were really important for self-defense, as, as well as a whole wide range of other uh, special weapons um, that I'll get into in another, another talk on another day. Um, they, these towns were also not uh, ruled so much by external authorities. So the emperor, in theory, is the ruler over all the free cities in the Holy Roman Empire, but in practice, uh, it varied how big the city is, how much power the city had. Uh, Augsburg was kind of a middling power militarily. Uh, they they had a, they were they had a lot of money, and that's also part of the story. They had a lot of influence, uh, and they were part of a coalition of other. They, they were part of something called the Swabian League. So there was about a, another sixty or seventy cities that they could call on for mutual support if they had trouble, and so they 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 would be assertive defensively. They wouldn't. Take orders that they didn't like, but they were they were not unlike some. There were some free cities that were a little more aggressive. Uh, for example, Lübeck, which is the head of the Hanseatic League, um, but Augsburg was a city that was their their military power was there to protect the city itself and their commerce, uh, their trade routes, and so on. And, and anybody that interfered with that and kidnap their citizens or rob their caravans and things like that was going to have trouble with their with their militia. And the militia is sort of like uh, the National Guard or something like that today, where you've got basically people that have day jobs, but have some training, have equipment. They've got a bunch of gear. In this case, in this period, that would mean armor and um, weapons like swords, which is a really important sidearm in this era. But a uh, their main weapon would be something like a gun, a handgun, uh, or, or maybe a crossbow, or uh, a large polearm like a pike or a halberd or something like that. That would be their main thing. And to be a citizen in one of these towns, because the emphasis was so heavily on defense, uh, meant that you had to join the militia if you're a man. Uh, if you're a woman who was the head of a household, you did not have to be in the militia yourself, but you had to provide somebody that could be in the in the militia. So that might be a journeyman, or one of your servants, even, or like a nephew or a son. Um, but and then you would you would be providing uh, the armor and 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 weaponry that this per individual, like basically equivalent for your household. So if you had a if you had a, a formidable house, you had a big place with you know ten rooms, you were expected to provide maybe a couple of people. And they better be well armed. And they might, you might, they might have to reply, uh, supply a horse and all that. Uh, and the reason I'm getting into this, you can see some imagery here of of some of the surviving defenses. Most most of the uh, defenses of Augsburg are long gone, but there's a few remnants, uh, including St. Jacob's Tower here, uh, which is uh, in an interesting area, the uh, St. Jacob neighborhood, which is where. It's, is essentially like a suburb of Augsburg. It's one of the first add-ons. This is very typical of these cities. They would have walls all around them. They would have suburb communities that are right outside the walls, and then eventually those would get walls too. And so they would grow piece by piece. And each each little municipality in one of these towns had its own little government. Um, so to encourage the safety of the community, uh, these towns would engage and encourage uh, the uh, participation by their citizens in uh, special sports that were martially related. So one of the things, the re one of the ways that I get here is because I practice uh, historical fencing for about 20 years. I'm very interested in historical fencing and the fight books of this era that are sort of a little bit like manuals of, of martial arts and sword fighting from this time period. And that was one of the things that they engaged in. They, the citizens would have these fencing contexts uh, called festschule. But what was more important for a community like Augsburg was the shooting contest, the, the Schützenfest. And I, I'm going to do a whole other talk about those. 
Uh, and they practice a lot of other weird sports. Like if you ever, you know, you see these these strange medieval uh, customs that are still around in places like Spain and Italy, and actually also in Germany and Switzerland and you know Czechia and Poland and a lot of other places. Uh, where you know, like uh, for example, in in uh, in in Spain, there's a there's a town where they throw tomatoes at each. Other. Everybody goes outside and they have this big tomato fight. Well, they they would have a lot of weird sort of games like that in these towns, and involving things like, you know, horse races. And uh, there's something that they still do in France called water jousting, where they get out on these boats. Again, that's another thing I'm going to dive into. They would push each other off of boats with poles, and all of these are kind of a little bit violent games or sports that are designed to encourage uh, um, skills that will be useful in warfare. And the most important one was shooting. And th and shooting was a really important sport in, in these towns and in Augsburg in particular. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the young people, including the women that, that also would participate in these uh, shooting contests, uh, but especially a lot of the young men would be really good shots. And that you combine that with the fact that the towns like Augsburg were producing the best firearms, that meant that uh, attacking a city like this, let's uh, even even though these places are very small by modern uh, modern uh, concept of a city. In fact, it really wouldn't be considered a city today; it would be considered a village in a lot of the world. But Augsburg in fifteen twenty four was had about maybe twenty five or thirty thousand people in it. Of that total probably less than half are citizens. Maybe maybe 10,000 of those people are citizens. And of the citizens, not all of them are of fighting age. Some of, some of them are too old to be in the militia. And only, you know, some of them, some percentage of them are men. So there's a, quite a few female citizens too. So women are not obligated in, to be in the militia. So, so the actual militia size is, let's say it's maybe four or 5,000 people at absolute maximum for a major emergency like defending the town, although they would also arm pretty much anybody else if the town itself was attacked. So you, you might have as many as eight or 10,000 people defending this community, which in the Middle Ages is a lot, especially if you're standing on the top of uh, you know, a 15 meter wall or up in, in a, you know, very high up in a, in a 30 meter tower, which might not only have your firearms, but you've also got cannons and special multi-barreled guns that can shoot you know 21 barrels uh almost like a almost like a gatling gun or something all kinds of all kinds of weaponry and it would effectively meant is that these places uh, uh, one of the larger free cities like augsburg augsburg was one of the larger of these um they were almost impossible to knock over for even the most sophisticated army, even the even the most powerful princely aristocrat of this era. Um, it was very hard to take out these, especially these German towns uh, up in the northern and central part of Europe uh, by force. And that had a lot to do with why we have bankers living in these towns. So Augsburg was probably maybe... Uh, yeah, you, know, you could certainly arguable, but I think it, it is. You can make a case that Augsburg was the most important city in the history of banking. Uh, we usually think when we think of bankers in the Middle Ages, you usually think of the Medici or the Bardi or some of these Italian bankers. But a lot of those Italian banks uh, failed, and a lot of those families got in big trouble. Uh, they they were meteoric rise to wealth and power, and then uh, they would get in trouble and. Uh, plummet back down to earth and, and sometimes into utter catastrophe. The Medici, uh, their bank actually did fail, but they managed to make the transition to being nobles because a lot of these bankers originally were commoners. But partly uh, that happened because a lot of these Italian cities were, there's a different sort of uh, combination of factors of that, that determined how the defense worked. And a lot of these town, Italian cities were captured by foreign armies. That did not really happen so often in, in the north of the Alps. And in Augsburg, we've got at least three significant banking families. The most important by far are the Fuggers, uh, but then not too far behind them are the Welsers. And then uh, you also have like the Hochstetters. And there's a couple of other uh, smaller banks that were active there in this little town of 30,000 people. So that brings us to uh, Jakob Fugger, 
who was the patriarch of the Fugger family um, in, in Augsburg. And this is a man that was so incredibly wealthy. Um, I've seen various estimates, but he was by, if you could translate the amount of money that he had um, into modern currency, he, he was definitely a billionaire. And he was much wealthier than, than the Medici were, for example. Um, as were the Welsers. There's, I'm going to do another thing about the Welsers and uh, the history of Venezuela, which a lot of people will really be blown away by that story. I was, certainly, when I found out about it. But he was so wealthy that he you wouldn't think he would need or want to live in a community like Augsburg because these, these, these communities were volatile. They were not uh, 100% stable. There was a, a constant uprisings, and there was many different factions. In Augsburg, uh, in particular, in spite of the fact that you had bankers and a lot of really wealthy merchants and sort of an elite class of what they call pa patrizer or patricians that were at the upper strata that you know ran a lot of the business of the city, you also had really powerful middle class that was uh, largely made up of the artisans, and they had their own artisans' guilds, and they were extremely assertive. If, if the city or the, the, the merchants or the bankers like uh, Jakob Fugger, even as incredibly wealthy and powerful as he was, were doing things that they didn't like in, within the walls of this you know, quite small community, um, it, they would cause serious trouble, and that happened all the time. And it, 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 there was sort of a difference between the towns in the German-speaking areas and like the Czech towns and Polish towns and so on, versus the Italian or Russian towns. In, in Italian, Italy or Russia, where you have the real city states, internal conflicts would get really, really, really bloody, and sometimes it would lead to the downfall of the city. Whereas the Germans, uh, and the towns in other places that were uh, like in Poland and Czechia um, and also in Scandinavia, like uh, the couple of small towns that they had in Sweden at this time, they were all chartered under uh, uh, what's called German town law. They used the charters from German towns because the Germans had kind of made an industry of creating these free cities. Um, you have to wonder why a super powerful, super prominent person like Jakob Fugger who literally had more money than the king or the emperor would want to live in a place like this. And we're going to spin back around to that. But before we got to kind of look at what a banker was in this period. So in the middle ages, banks were not exactly uh, the kind of institutions that we know today. Um, medieval banks were essentially like really big pawn shop operations. In other words, to get some money from a medieval banker, you had to put up some property, and it wasn't like your old beat-up guitar or a pair of boots that you don't wear anymore or something like that. It was like it had to be land or maybe some special rights that you had that, you, that were transferable uh, or some really valuable you know, jewels or something. It had to be something significant. And the, one of the things that the Fuggers did that um, really put them above a lot of their competition in the banking world was that they developed a preference for certain kinds of property, in particular mines. And the fact that they kind of had this, uh, this, this relationship with these communities that they were in, these towns that they were in, where there was a lot of artisans, meant that they were able to run mines. So they started buying lands that were either already had a mine on it or that their technical people could determine that there was uh, copper or iron or silver or something else that, you know, sometimes there's gold, uh, salt, other things, alum. There's different, there's different, uh, different things they were looking for. But um, in particular, they got, they, they sort of uh, started collecting copper and silver mines uh, all over Europe. You know, you want to borrow money from the Fuggers. First of all, they're not loaning money to just regular people. They're loaning money to princely nobility. And pretty soon they're loaning money to kings and the emperor. Uh, and in particular, the Fuggers kind of had a relationship that I, it's hard to call it exactly a friendship, but very close uh, political alliance with the Habsburg family. This is one of these really powerful princely families that more or less comes from, comes out of uh, Austria, although they have, uh, there was branches of the family that were living in many other parts of Europe. 
And they were one of these really powerful Prince Elector families, which means that they're the families that uh, one of the, the seven families that gets to vote on who's going to be the next Holy Roman Emperor. And they themselves became the Holy Roman Emperors largely because of money that was provided by the Fuggers. By, in particular, Jacob Fugger really was one of the ones that took the turn that helped the, the uh, Habsburgs rise to power and to basically win these elections. So they had the emperor and, in many countries, the kings, like places like Hungary uh, and Bohemia, which is now more or less Czechia, uh, and uh, Poland and other places. They, the, the, uh, the king was not just automatically going to be the eldest son of the last king that that person might have you know some extra chance but very likely it will not be that person a lot of the times because um that's not always going to be the most qualified or the one that has the most uh assets that to bribe everybody else and pay off all the other families so that they they will concede to this person getting in there uh Jakob Fugger helped the Habsburgs who were not Really, the most they were not they were not the most uh, militarily successful of these prince elector families. They were not like the, the at least not until later, not until after uh, Fugger's influence, you might say. Uh, but they 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 did have a lot of uh, children. They were able to get into these politically arranged marriages and marry themselves into all the other princely families. And Fugger decided that they were going to be his his ally. He was going to put his money behind them and in return get the things that he wanted. Now, they, when I say that they're allies, again, this is very fraught because for the princely nobility, for any noble, for any noble, for even the even the guy that you know only owns like half a village somewhere, uh, who's basically poor, you know, he has three horses and a suit of armor and you know not a whole lot else. He even that guy thinks his blood is blue and he looks at Jakob Fugger, who's although he's a patrician, he's sort of an elite of the town, to the nobility at that time throughout Europe, uh, they looked at these people as trash. They're like subhuman. You know, they're if you go back far enough in, in Jacob Fugger's family, you're gonna find artisans. You know, they're not necessarily uh uh from the nobility. And that the you know, they had this attitude that those people were not on the same level. And so they, they resented relying on somebody like that. And that's any noble. Now, if you're talking about a princely family like the, like the Habsburgs, they really, they, they look that way. They, they look down on the, on the counts and the barons for, you know, for a commoner from some city, which they refer to as shopkeepers, or sometimes uh, some of the other nobles like uh, Gutz von Billingen used to call them uh, pepper bags because they were trading in you know spices and pepper and, and you know, you rob them and they got a bunch of pepper so it's just like another uh, you know thing to 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 exploit and they looked at they looked at patricians and and burghers as if they were not even peasants but serfs they just thought everybody was just like a cattle for them I mean that that was their attitude so. If you if you loaned a ton of money to somebody like uh, Ma, you know Emperor Maximilian or uh, you know one of his sons you know that's dangerous because a they got a whole lot of money that they're going to have to pay back or they're going to lose land that they probably don't want to lose uh, or and and there's that's another I'm going to go on another story about that about how what happened when uh, the Wellsers loaned a bunch of money money to the Habsburgs and ended up with what's now Venezuela and a big chunk of Colombia for a little while. Uh, that's a different banking family here in Augsburg. But essentially that explains why Jakob Fugger did not just go build some giant castle in the countryside and live there. He, he had to live in this community because that was the only safe place. Uh, you know, with, when you've got a community of 30,000 people of whom, you know, 10 or 15,000 can actively participate in defense and a bunch of five or 6,000 of those are really elite marksmen with very advanced guns and cannons and so on even somebody like the Habsburg emperor is going to hesitate uh before attacking that i mean he might be able to knock that over but he'll have to use so much of his army that uh other parts of his empire are going to be vulnerable and his other enemies could exploit it you know so it's a, it's a very uh it's a very risky thing to attack one of these towns so that's why Jakob ends up living here in Augsburg and continuing to live there 
And yet there's trouble with that because a lot of people looked at the wealth that he had and the church in particular was going to be critical of any banker whom they would accuse of usury, which specifically, technically usury means loaning money for interest. And um, there, there were kind of workarounds for that. They didn't really necessarily always charge interest directly in the same way that a bank would today, but effectively they did. And everybody knew it. And so they saw him as sort of a parasite. And a lot of the, a lot of the town folk saw that, looked, saw it that way too. So uh, Jacob, Jacob Fugger, who like pretty much any banker you can think of almost, was kind of parsimonious by nature. He didn't just throw money around. But he was a patron, and he did engage in charity because that was how you uh, cured yourself of the taint of usury. Uh, of of the, and of the reputational uh, hit that you took from sort of you know making money from your money, just putting you know giving people money and then making money when they failed to pay you back, uh, which is looked at you know in a negative light in the Middle Ages. And and the Fuggers, one of the other things they did was they helped sort of uh, make changes in the church that <laughs> that gave them more of a pass on that. But the other thing they needed to do in order to um, continue to live in harmony in, in this community was to show that they were friends of the community, that they were contributing. And this was a big thing in the Middle Ages. So these, these towns, um, they, they, most of the public funding went to defense. So a lot of the internal uh, infrastructure and so on uh, was basically provided by what some people call the medieval charity industry. They made some changes in the Catholic Church in the uh, high medieval period, and, and, and then which continued on into the late medieval, which made uh, acts of charity sort of a special act of faith that would uh, uh, supposedly buy you off from time in purgatory and things like that. But it also raised the social capital, the social value of of basically contributing money to do good works. And so that included things like... Uh, building schools, hospitals, uh, water systems. This is how a lot of the water systems got created, uh, bridges. Um, so these towns actually had pretty good water systems. It's a whole other thing for yet another uh, talk one day. Um, and Fugger had been kind of resisting that because he really was a, he was a cheap guy. He didn't really want to spend a lot of money uh, unless he was going to get something out of it. Now, we do have a lot of pictures of Fugger because he was an art patron. He did, he did see the merit and the value of art like uh, Albrecht Dürer and, you know, uh, Jörg Bro and, uh, you know, the Holbeins and people like that. So we have a lot of great paintings of him. And this is one of the advantages of doing any kind of research on a place like Augsburg because it's a literate town. Pretty much everybody can read and write. And there's a lot of painters there. You know, we've got people like... Uh, Hans Holbein and his brother uh, Ambrosius Holbein and uh, Jörg Bro was active there. There was a whole lot of other artists. And so we have a lot of artwork that could not only show us the portraits of really important people like Jakob Fugger, but also day-to-day -day life. Like there's this wonderful series of, of murals called the Augsburg Monatsbilder, which shows life across a range of months. So each one is supposed to represent three months. And this has survived, uh, which is really great for us, because um, it shows us, you know, what life was like for for ordinary people, for the artisans and the middle class people and the servants and and the peasants that were coming to town, and the, you know, the Jewish people that were coming into town, and the uh, people from other parts of Europe that were coming in there, and other parts of the world, because you know, a little town like Augsburg, they were trading with places all over. They would be trading with, you know, Portugal and, you know. They traded with the Ottomans. They traded with the, the Mamluks down in Egypt, you know, all over Italy, all over Eastern Europe, you know, um, East Central Europe, or, uh, Poland and Czechia and places like that. So these were quite lively communities, and we could see that in the artwork. And um, Jakob did, did, did get a lot of portraits painted, and we also have portraits of a guy called Matthaus Schwarz, who was his accountant. Uh, and this guy is super interesting. This is worth a little segue here because so one of the other things, aside from collecting copper mines that really put the Fuggers ahead of their competition was that they they were masters of the art of double-entry bookkeeping. If you've ever done any 
accounting. Uh, if you if you have to do books for your for a business or something like that, you'll know what that is. This is a deceptively simple, very very powerful method of bookkeeping that the Fuggers learned due to their connections to Venice, and the Venetians apparently got it from what was then called Dalmatia and what we would today call Croatia. From uh, or it, it, apparently, this is still probably you know it's debated, but anyway. So this Matthaus Schwarz, who was like a professional, you may call him like upper middle class. Um, he was an accountant for a very very rich person, and you see there's a wonderful painting that shows uh, you know Jakob Fugger, uh with him, and it's it's so prosaic. I love that this wonder this really powerful guy. They're just standing in the same room with his accountant, and they're they're figuring out who owes what. Um, that guy was also apparently quite well paid and he he hired painters to paint portraits of himself in various different costumes for his whole life i think every 3 or 4 months you know he had he had paintings and so there's this book of of all those portraits that he had painted some people call it the renaissance instagram uh, but again this this gives us a really interesting perspective on what life was like in this town and that that that's very helpful in trying to figure out something like uh, the Fugari. Um, and so uh, Jakob Fugger needed to show that he was useful to the community and he was under this pressure. And at some point he just decided, okay, we're going to do uh, kind of something big. And what he did was he designated uh, a, a, a bunch of buildings of the equivalent to a couple of city blocks, like pretty big little section of, I mean, big little, uh, a, s a substantial section of this little town that he was going to make into public housing. Now, this was a thing. This was one of the things that ch that you would do as active charity in the Middle Ages was provide housing for people that either they didn't have big families or you know had run out of uh, money and needed to be taken care of in their old age. It's sort of like retirement homes um, for especially for the artisans and some of the older servants and so on that were called almshouses. Those were all over the place. And an almshouse would usually take care of a, maybe a, a dozen or a half dozen or sometimes a you know a couple of score people, but not really that many. But they would they had they had foundations and charitable donations would keep them going, and they would take pick, they would take care of these people you know free of charge. Unlike today, where if, if you ever had an elderly relative and had maybe they get dementia or something like that, and you have to look into what that. Is like you're gonna you're gonna lose your own uh, family legacy of of all the money that you've saved up over generations, putting somebody you know taking care of somebody like that today. But back then, they were surprisingly good at taking care of people. Um, Jacob Fugger, uh, you know, he's a he was a very wealthy guy, so he set up this place called the Fugere. Now, this this is a particular neighborhood that um, I am not going to successfully pronounce this the German word for it but we call it the let's let's call it the St. Jacob's quarter or the St. Jacob's municipality it's uh it's on the eastern side of Nuremberg it was one of the first suburbs and um it's named after St. Jacob it's not like it's named after Jacob Fugger it's more like the other way around Jacob Fugger is named after St. Jacob too and this was an area where there was a really important church um that was a pilgrimage site for, for in within the town uh, of Augsburg. Uh, this is a very common thing with a lot of these free cities as well, because the free cities are safe. Uh, they, they would set up churches inside of these towns that they would have enough churches for maybe three or four times the population of the town. And the reason is, is because in the mid in the medieval world and in the Catholic church in general, I think um, even today, there are saints that are for every you know, profession, every group of people, every every region has their own patron saint. So, for example, uh, you know, if you're a painter, there was a lot of painters in Augsburg, that their patron saint is St. Luke. So on St. Luke's Day, they're going to have a big festival. They're all going to come. So all the little smaller towns around Augsburg will come to Augsburg to the Church of St. Luke, um, uh, you know, to celebrate on that day. And so this particular neighborhood um, have has a big church of St. Jacob, which was a pilgrimage destination. And it was on the way of St. James, which is this massive pilgrimage road that goes all the way across Europe. That's like a whole other discussion. So Jakob Fugger uh, takes all these warehouses and he, he asks an, uh, one of his architects, or maybe it was one of the guys that was working for the city, to renovate them into public housing. And it takes about 10 years. 
And I think they originally started with about 50 buildings, which turned out to be 120 apartments. This was later uh, increased by the city to 67 buildings and 147 apartments. It's enough for about 250 people, maybe a little more or less, depending on you know how much how much families were in there. These are pretty small apartments. Uh, you can get a look at what they look like. There's one that's preserved that in the sort of 16th century uh, style. Um, so you can kind of see what they look like. You know, the bed has the, you know, those four poster beds where they're actually going to have blankets all around them because the, they would start the fire, uh, you know, when they go into bed. But the uh, fire is going to go out by the time they get up in the morning. So to keep, you know, and it gets quite cold in that part of Germany. I can tell you I've lived there myself in the winter, you know, January or something like that. So, so they would close up their bed. Sometimes they'd have little boxes. Uh, and they have, you can see a bed warmer there that's like, a, you know, you'd fill that full of coals and put it at the bottom of the bed to keep it warm. You know, getting, staying warm is really important. Um, Fugger put up 10,000 gulden, which I've been trying to figure out uh, the most accurate uh, way, convert, way to convert that. It's really hard to convert that currency that they used then into modern currency because the currency then fluctuated in value all the time. Our modern currencies fluctuate. But the 10,000 gulden adds up to somewhere between like maybe 800,000 to 3 million euro today. And it's pretty close to the, maybe let's call it just a little bit over that on dollars. Um, so substantial investment but considering considering how long it it, it lasted, uh, it was a bargain, and we'll circle back to that. Uh, it was financed through a bunch of Fugger holdings uh, in the Black Forest, which is in uh, that same region of of Swabia, and um, so this 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 is another interesting aspect of this. So forests were seen as assets in the Middle Middle Ages, and um, they would do a lot of different things in them. They would they would do some logging. They would do hunting, fishing. They would have apiaries in the forests. That was something that the Germans had kind of learned from the Slavs, um, the very advanced science of of beekeeping. And um, there were two kinds of beekeeping. They would do some in these special walls that they would make that are it's a little bit similar to the way beekeeping is done today. And then they had wild beekeeping that was done in the forest. They would also do things like coppicing, where they would have trees that were cut in such a way so that they produce a lot of little uh, uh, saplings, kind of like a lot of, a lot of little, little uh, branches that were vertical that would come out. And, and these were used to make poles for all sorts of things, like brooms or weapons like halberds or bow staves, depending on what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, tree, tree wood it is. And so this is the interesting part in that it's, there's parts of the world where, you know, the value of trees were understood, but they, they would end up cutting down the forest because then it's, you get a lot more money in the short term. Jakob Fugger, like most of the, uh, the medieval um, people of his class, you know, medieval merchants and um, the, the authorities that run these towns, would prefer to have the forest continue for a long time. So, like, do you take, you know... 100% of the wealth of the forest, like cut all the trees down and hunt all the animals out and just turning it into, sell it and turn it into a farm or something? Or do you constantly every year take 5% of the value of it out? And that's what they did. That's why, you know, in France, you still have forests largely because of the uh, aristocracy. They, they kept the forest for hunting preserves and things. In, and in Germany, um, it's partly the aristocracy that preserved the forest. It's also partly these free cities like Augsburg that owned a lot of forest land and all, all over, all over central Europe, you know, well beyond Germany, uh, you know, Poland, uh, Czechia and Austria and Hungary and places like that as well. Um, Switzerland, you know, uh, where you don't really have princes. Um, so he set this place up. He financed it through land that he owned in the forest. Now, the interesting thing is that the forest is still there too. Not only has the Fugari lasted five centuries, and all these people are still living there to this day, paying one euro a year. There's also a couple of other rules. They close the gates at 10 o'clock uh, to get a, a place there. You can't have any debts. You have to be Catholic. And supposedly you have to make a prayer to the Fuggers, I think, once a week or something like that. And believe me, the Fuggers need all the help they can get to get out of purgatory because they're probably still in there. Um, but it's very interesting from the point of view of the modern world. This is one of the themes I, I see 
being sort of uh, thrusting itself forward when I'm looking at the history of these medieval towns. Um, they're the uh, they're not what we would think of. It's not we, when we see a medieval town in a um, you know a, a modern film or you know in depictions in video games or whatever and, you know, role playing games. You know, I, I do I write, I'm a game designer and I do role playing games that are historically based. But in most of the popular culture, a medieval town looks like a really crummy part of a Victorian slum from London in the 19th century. Everybody speaks with a Victorian uh, with a cockney accent. You know, they're selling like barbecued rats on sticks. Everything's muddy and filthy and broken down, and nobody seems to be able to know how to hang a door properly. You know, there's just like uneven boards. And, you know, like that's not what these places were like. So. That's that's the first revelation. The second revelation is that all these little free cities, especially in the city states too, you know, places like Florence or Venice or you know Veliki Novgorod in Russia, places like that. Th these were more volatile than some place like Augsburg, but they were also more creative. I mean, if you compare the creative output of Florence uh, to anywhere at almost any time, you know, Renaissance, late medieval Florence, all the way back to the you know, early 14th century through the 16th, uh, the output of new ideas and artwork and credible innovations in, in architecture and everything else is just breathtaking, just beyond belief. And it's a bigger city. Um, all of these communities, whether it's those or, or these German ones, which lasted a little longer, uh, they, they're, they all are like little laboratories of social policy so today um you know if you listen to a lot of modern in let's say 20th century especially economists people from the chicago school the austrian school will tell you very confidently that you can't keep a pension going like the pensions are impossible you want to have a you know a, a bunch of uh, plumbers or doctors or whoever that are going to have a pension when they retire no you can't do it, it doesn't make sense in economic theory well these people made it work. You know, can you utilize nature? Can you utilize a forest or any other part of nature? Because this was also an issue. You know, they were already having issues with po pollution. That was a big issue for these towns. You know, all the way back to the 12th century, you start seeing regulations on that. Um, can you utilize it without destroying it from pollution? Can you utilize it without using it up? This is something we were struggling with in the 20th century, too, in the you know, forests in the Northwest in the United States, where they were clear cutting and, and then you'd have mudslides like the, the the lumber workers towns that they lived in would get buried in mudslides and they've learned to be a little more careful about how they do the the logging they already knew this in the middle ages and they figured it out and they figured out public services that were a lot better than uh you know what we you might think um the school systems were extremely um effective i mean if people come out of them and seem to know how to read and write they seem to know how to do math. They 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 switch from Roman numerals, which trust me, Matthaus Schwartz, the accountant for Jacob Fugger, would have died of old age at the at the age of thirty if he had to do all that accounting in in, in Roman numerals. You know, they but they these towns just you know they they used Fibonacci's Libra Bacchi, which had the Indian numbers in it, and they switched over to that quick. They they went to the best practices, and. They show us that that man can kind of live in harmony with nature. I think that's another aspect of this. Is all I think it all ties together. We tend to look at people today from a we're, we have an influence in the United States from Puritans, and we think of um, people are poor because of their own bad decisions, and that's true sometimes. Some people, I mean, I was poor in my life, and some of that was because of bad decisions that I made. But it's not always true. A lot of times, it's it's not anything that they that they did there's whole communities you know in our in the united states that have been hollowed out by globalization and i don't want to get too political here but just as an example with the fugari one of the people that lived in the fugari was the great grandfather uh, of uh mozart wolfgang amadeus mozart his great grandfather was called franz mozart he was a master mason and the son of a bookbinder and you know masonry is hard work I have a friend who's a stone cutter. It's just, you know, he works with a lot of masons, and uh, that is hard work. I have another friend who's a mason. Actually, I'm thinking about it uh, in in Asheville, North Carolina. Moving all those big rocks, man, it takes a toll out of your body. So you're going to need some help when you're older, especially if you don't have a really big family. 
Well, this guy was supported at the Fugari in Augsburg. That's where Mozart's family originally comes from. And then they uh, later, you know, later generations ended up, the, the world changed. The epicenter of power shifted for various reasons. Maybe I'll talk about it in another, another uh, one of these. And the, so Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart went to Vienna to work, be at the court of the emperor, who was, you know, kind of helped the family was created by the, uh, the, by the Fuggers. But uh, yeah, we now have his music, this genius that's trapped in people whose lives are, are constrained by poverty. That it, it, we're hurting ourselves, I think, maybe arguably by by not doing something that helps and and that, that doesn't end up into a disaster. You know, where I'm from, we had public housing that was really um, didn't work out too well, and I think a lot of parts of the world do. So this is just one of the examples that we can look at. These little town, thirty thousand people. What did they do? How did they make it work? Can that be scaled up? I don't know. You know, can you do something like the Fugari? But the Fugari is still there, man. It lasted 500 years. The forest is still there, too. And I think, uh, you know, that's a, one of many lessons worth, worth looking at from this period. Thanks for listening to me. My name is Jean-Henri Chandler, and uh, I'm game designer. I made Codex Integrum, Codex Martialis, and I have a website, jeanhenrichandler.com, too. And I sell books and uh, games and such. And I'll, I'll include links to several things from this talk. Um, not so much my opinionating here at the end, but the historical facts um, and some of the art and everything uh, in the notes down at the bottom of this. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, hope, uh, hope to talk to you again soon.